The cycle of economic boom and bust is commonly called the business cycle, as if it were a natural occurrence like the hydrological or carbon cycle. These natural cycles are ultimately driven by the sun. But what is it that drives the business cycle? One answer is the supply of money. And, as we have seen, the supply of money is dependent on loans. So let's look at what happens during the lifetime of an individual loan. We've seen how bank credit is nothing more than the bank's promise to pay, which the bank has created on its books to balance the borrower's promise to pay that it has received. The bank's promise to pay is usually spent on some real good or service and allowed to circulate, making the efficient exchange of goods and services easier to accomplish. As a medium of exchange, today's promise to pay money is unsurpassed in its usefulness and flexibility. However, because no money is created to pay the interest, a seemingly impossible situation is created. On the face of it, if borrowers had to pay the interest they owe all at once, they would have to fight it out for a limited sum of existing money that was very much less than the total owed. The percentage that would be unable to pay off their loans would be simple to calculate. However, interest is usually paid over time, not all at once. If this interest income is recycled into the general economy as spending, it can be available to be earned repeatedly. Once we understand this, the question of whether interest is actually unpayable becomes more perplexing. Is there such a thing as a sustainable system of lending that does not produce mathematically inevitable defaults? In the Middle Ages, usury, meaning charging interest, or any form of making gain solely from having money, was condemned as a sin. While the justification was moral, the reason was practical. In a fixed money supply like gold, anyone systematically rolling over all of their loan money at interest will soon end up with all the money. This problem was a big factor in the ruin of Rome. Private accumulations of gold forced the government to mint coins made of base metals instead of the real thing. Debased currency led to failing confidence and ultimate decline. The lesson was well learned. For the next thousand years, the Roman Catholic Church declared collecting interest on a loan to be a sin punishable by excommunication. In some countries, the penalty for practicing usury was death. Is charging interest really a sin? While today it seems very reasonable to charge for the use of money, there's a simple and unavoidable problem with doing so. Unless moneylenders spend every penny of interest they receive in such a way that the borrowers can earn it again, the borrowers are going to come up short regardless of their hard work and personal virtues. Someone will default simply as a result of the arithmetic. This is easy to picture where there's a fixed money supply like gold coin. As long as all of the coins taken in as interest are spent so that the borrowers can earn them, the same coins can be used to pay the interest over and over. The lender can profit by buying real things with this coin, but the coin itself must be spent, not lent nor removed from circulation. Leaving aside any moral considerations, this arrangement would be sustainable. However, if the interest coins are re-lent at interest or removed from circulation by hoarding, there will be an inherent shortage of coins with which to pay off the aggregate debt. The situation is essentially no different in our current debt-based system. As we have seen, nowadays virtually every dollar comes into existence as debt, with a scheduled appointment to be extinguished as a principal payment on the loan that created it. Thus, for all borrowers to be able to make their payments of principal plus interest, two things must be true. The dollar created as the principal of the loan must be available to be earned by the borrower in order to make the principal payment that extinguishes that dollar. And, Every dollar the borrower pays to the bank as interest 
must also be available to be repeatedly earned by the borrower so that it can be paid as interest again and again. There is a common theory, undoubtedly popular with lenders, that because the banks spend their interest earnings as operating expenses, interest to depositors and shareholders' dividends, there is in fact enough money released back into the community to make all payments. However, like the idea of absolute shortage, this is an oversimplification. Picture what happens if someone else, such as you or I or an institutional non-bank lender, obtains this dollar and then lends it out at interest. Well, now that same dollar is simultaneously owed to two lenders and has two simultaneous interest charges attached to it. In addition, if this dollar is loaned, repaid, and reloaned by the secondary lender, it is not available to pay off the principal of the loan that created it, except as another loan. So, can we borrow from Peter to pay Paul and borrow from Paul to pay Peter? This gets interesting. We can. However, each time money is borrowed, there's an interest charge added that also must be paid. If all added interest charges can be earned, all payments can be made. On this basis, many economists and defenders of the current system claim there can never be a shortage of money and all payments can be made. But this seems to be a false assurance. For instance, if secondary lenders capture some of the money needed to retire the loan that created that money, the original loan can never be retired. The deficiency will have to be borrowed over and over forever, each time at interest. Each deficiency will be cumulative, adding to an ever-building total of debt that can never be paid off. And it stands to reason that for each added interest charge in the system as a whole, something extra is demanded of the system as a whole to pay for it. This affects everyone, producers, governments and consumers. For producers, that something extra must be raised through higher prices or more sales. However, competition for more sales usually requires lowering prices, necessitating even more sales, and leads to overproduction and saturation of the market. The end result can mean job losses, plant closures and bankruptcies. For governments, that something extra is raised by increasing taxes. But increasing taxes drains money from the productive economy, resulting in a reduction in the collective ability to pay taxes, which then necessitates increased government borrowing and additional interest charges. For consumers, something extra can mean getting an additional job, or borrowing to pay past debts, or paying off debt over longer periods of time. However, competition for jobs tends to lower wages and paying over longer periods of time adds enormously to the amount of interest owed. And of course, borrowing to pay off past debts is like trying to fill a hole with more hole. And that is the situation we find ourselves in today. Producers can't sell more because consumers can't afford to buy. Governments are cutting taxes, not raising them. 